Hello and welcome to the Eating Disorder Therapist podcast. This is a podcast to help you find peace with food and overcome disordered eating. And I'm Harriet Frew, aka the Eating Disorder Therapist. And I'm so excited to share with you all kinds of stories, tips, information and guest interviews to help you on your journey in finding peace with food. So thank you so much for listening today. Now today I'm speaking to Amber Rome Maniac, who is a returning guest to the Eating Disorder Therapist podcast. Amber is an emotional eating, digestive and hormone expert who helps professional women achieve optimal health through mindful eating, self-care and overcoming self-sabotage with food. Her podcast, the No Sugar Coating Podcast, has nearly 2 million downloads, over 450 episodes and is listened to in over 88 countries. And she was featured on TV personality Whitney Port's podcast and has also appeared on local TV 50 times in the last three years alone. Amber overcame her own emotional eating after gaining and losing more than a thousand pounds and spending over $50,000 on binge foods and spending five years balancing her hormones and digestion. Now she helps others achieve body freedom so they have the confidence and health to create amazing lives. In the episode today, Amber talks about healing your wounded inner child. She shares very personally about her own journey and one of the early events that hugely impacted her relationship with food and body. Amber shares how inner child wounding shows up in our relationship with food, with eating disorder behaviours and negative body image. And she then explores the steps that you can take to heal your inner child through understanding your story, acknowledging and releasing feelings and then treating yourself with the love and kindness that you deserve. Amber does a deep dive here and gives a multitude of tips and wisdom on how to find a more balanced place of harmony and healing, drawing on her own lived experience with great vulnerability and through many years of supporting her clients. Let's get to the conversation. Time for a short advertisement break. On the outside, you have it all together. You're successful. You seem happy. But what your friends and family don't see is that you're living in the vicious cycle of bulimia. You know that something needs to change, your health depends on it, but you just don't know where to start or how to move forward. That's where Conquering Bulimia comes in. It's a -a one-of-a-kind online recovery course brought to you by certified eating disorder coaches Sarah Lee and Merritt Elizabeth. They know exactly what you're going through. They've both recovered from bulimia and have teamed up with leading experts to create an online course with over 70 videos as a powerful addition to your recovery. Conquering Bulimia is private and self-paced, filled with personal stories and coaching tips that will teach you how to change your behaviours for good. It will challenge and inspire you, and it's affordable, offered at an incredible discount of over 60% of the cost of one-on-one coaching. Break free from bulimia on your terms and start living the life of peace you deserve at conqueringbulimia.com. Hi, Amber. Welcome back to the podcast. Hi, Harriet. Thank you for having me. How are you? Yeah, no, I'm really good. Thank you. And it's been so nice. We've been having a nice chat, haven't we, before we've been on air, which is really nice to connect with a fellow manifester and someone else in the <laughs> space and yes. who's also got a podcast, etc. So yeah, lovely to connect with you. Likewise. And it is nice to kind of catch up a little bit before we get on and record the episode and just hear about things going on. And Yeah, it's great to be on the podcast again with a fellow manifester. You know that there's only like 9% of humanity is manifestors. I know, it's incredible, isn't it? (laughs) It is, it's super cool. (laughs) How long ago actually did you find out that you were a manifester, Amber? I think it was about two and a half years ago. I joined a course and they were talking about human design. And then I was like, ooh, this is interesting. And so I did my chart and everything and found out then. How about you? Yeah, no, about a year ago, probably almost okay. to the day, I think, around. It was oh. March last year. Yeah. So incredibly validating, actually, for yes. me. Yeah, really. And just, yeah, help me understand a lot of things about myself. Very, very mm-hmm. helpful. <laughs> it is really helpful, actually. So Amber, just so great to have you back. And, you know, your episodes are always like hugely popular with the listeners. But for anyone that doesn't know you already, could you just please introduce yourself? Yeah, for sure. And I'm glad everyone's loving the chat. So my name is Amber Romaniak, and I'm an emotional eating, digestive and hormone expert. And I help women all over the world fully overcome self-sabotage with food, whether it's emotional eating to binging, binging and purging and building the confidence, the body love, and also working through things like the hormone issues, the gut issues, the weight loss blocks, the cravings, all in a very gentle, 
non-diet, non-restrictive way to help you take your power back with food and your body and also become really in tune with your body, your symptoms, your emotional state so that you can feel really empowered living your life. And so I've had my business for about 10 and a half years now. And it's such a blessing to, you know, have gone through all of what I help my clients with myself, you know, binge eating, not that I was happy that I went through it, but to the point where you're eating out of a garbage can and, you know, binge eating five or six days a week. And, you know, a lot of that stemmed back to childhood and what we're going to talk about today, but like really having that lack of self-love and the body shame and chasing the number on the scale and then by accidentally creating a million hormone issues and gut issues that took a few years to heal. But it all led me to the path of, you know, starting the business and being of service to others because it's, you know, it's really true when they say your darkest days can turn into some of your most beautiful gifts to offer the world. Yeah, I know. It's so true, isn't it? I think I definitely sort of resonate with so much of that myself, like definitely coming into this field really as the wounded healer. But, Mm -hmm. you know, and what was my deepest pain has definitely become my deepest passion and purpose. And it sounds like that's very true also for yourself. Mm -hmm. It is. And it's so fulfilling to, you know, be open and be vulnerable and share and hear how many others can relate and to just let others know that they're not alone and that they can fully overcome, you know, their struggles or whatever just feels like it's hopeless to shift. That's the whole point, right? It's so nice to hear when someone is listening and you know they're like, oh, thank you for sharing your heart because I'm not alone and I feel inspired that I can make a change. Yeah, and I think it's so important, isn't it? Having that sort of seed of hope, really. And when Mm. you're really hearing what other people have been through and realizing recovery is possible and realizing, yeah, someone else has been in a very dark place but has kind of made it through, it helps you to keep putting one foot in front of the other. 100%. And so much good has come out of healing my relationship with food. Everything I have now and have created in my life is thanks to being willing to look at what was going on and work through it. So I'm very blessed and grateful for what happened because life is amazing. Mm. Okay, so we're going to talk a bit about our wounded inner child and relationship with food. So Amber, before we sort of talk about the wounded inner child, could you just explain a little bit to the listeners about what do we mean when we sort of talk about our inner child? Yeah, for sure. So we all have an inner child and our inner child largely is us when we're younger, right? And in our adolescence from zero to, you know, seven, eight, nine, 10 years of old. And those first 10 years where your subconscious is fully open and you're taking in everything around you. And sometimes we have circumstances that happen to us somewhere, you know, in that young, innocent age that can really have a significant impact on the rest of our lives. However, also our inner child could have been you last week that got hurt or upset or, Someone said something that, you know, you really took personally or you did something to yourself that you got really hard on yourself about. So the inner child to me is really this vulnerable, like very like sensitive part of us that we often forget or don't even realize is there. And what we don't realize is that I'll just use my example. So when I was five, my first day on the school bus, the older boys called me fat and ugly. And then the whole bus made fun of me. And that experience really wounded me and me at that age because I didn't know how to process through it. I didn't know how to just brush it off. And I believe them because they were strangers. So it must have been true. And so then I took on the identity of fat and ugly for the next 20 years of my life. And I just always remember that experience And that memory got imprinted in my nervous system and it really, it led my insecurity, it led my body image struggles and all these things. And so, but the thing is, is we're never taught about our inner child or how to connect with our inner child or how our inner child could impact our relationship with food, body, self-worth, any part of our being. And so we actually have this part of our inner child that will lead us from insecurity. And if we don't ever look at it, it will often like keep fueling behaviors or, you know, the way we feel emotionally or certain habits that we have. So also, like I said, though, the wounded inner child could be you last week or the inner child, something that happened to you recently that you're not going in and connecting with this part of you that is there, that is, you know, feeling a little ignored or a lot ignored. Mm. And thank you so much for sharing about your experience on the bus. It's just so sad, isn't it? I think it's well just to hear, isn't it? Like a little five-year-old and It's just those experiences, I think they're just so devastating, aren't they? When we're just so young and vulnerable. 
They mm-hmm. are. They really are. Like after that, I'm like, I can't trust boys. I don't want to be friends with boys. I don't want to get hurt. The only male I trust is my dad. Like it just creates this whole like you put this wall up, right? Because you have this fear of getting hurt again. And because we don't necessarily learn how to process things like that at that age. And I didn't want to go to my parents and be like, oh, this happened, right? So it's like you feel almost like I have to just carry this burden. And then it just turns into this very emotionally heavy burden if we don't work through it. And it just accumulates year after year after year after year. Yeah, I know. It makes so much sense. And How does that sort of show up as well then, do you think, sort of in our relationship with food, you know, maybe, you know, like with your example, I guess you had that really like devastating experience, it caused a lot of distress, you weren't able to sort of understandably process it or make sense of it at such a young age. So did you even find like as a child, maybe some of that wounding started to sort of show up? Or was it kind of more later on sort of through food behaviors and things? Oh, great point. And I'm glad that you brought that up. So no, like food started to become a friend right around that time. And so I think there was a couple things that really, you know, molded that relationship with food, that unconscious emotional eating from a young age. And I remember thinking, oh, well, the boys call me fat and ugly, but the food never does. So like food is my friend, right? I'm going to soothe and and use it for comfort and coping and numbing. I just didn't know that that's what I was doing at the time. But I actually remember me saying that the food won't hurt me. So I'm going to immerse more of my focus and attention into eating. And so, yeah, from that time on, I had a very unconscious emotional eating behavior that I didn't realize was, you know, an emotional eating behavior that just snowballed as I grew up. I think for a lot of people, they can have different experiences as a child. Some of the most common ones that I see with my clients are things like their parents talking negatively about their own bodies when they were children, mothers saying how much they hate their bodies, fathers, you know, being critical of, you know, siblings or other people, even if a family member is making fun of other people and, you know, that can really make you afraid of like, oh my gosh, what would they say about me? Maybe your parents, you know, put you on a diet at a young age or poked at your belly and called you fat or right. Like these are the kinds of things that will really impact us at such a young age and stay with us into adulthood if we don't, you know, start looking at them and working through them. And so then you have the chronic diet or the person with the all or nothing perfection mentality, you know, they didn't feel like they got enough love or attention. And so now they're using food as a coping mechanism where they feel they have to look perfect and have the perfect body and be the perfect weight, quote unquote, right? Everything that we're sold. And so that really can fuel a lot of emotional eating, binge eating and self-sabotage with food. And so where I think it really meshes with food But just to explain some of the other experiences is I really think that we have, it might be one memorable experience, but it may be an accumulation of really small things that seemed innocent that actually are like get imprinted in your subconscious mind because your subconscious is always open and takes everything in it. It can't recognize what is like good and what is not and or what is real and what is false. So we take everything in and then over time you create, you know, a set of beliefs, behaviors and kind of like emotional states that you find yourself in. And so if you were like me, where you had an experience or you had this accumulation of experiences at a young age where you felt alone, maybe you got abandoned. Maybe, you know, I have some clients said my parents weren't home when I got home from school and I was too young to be home by myself. And so I was afraid and I sat in the closet and ate, right? Like there's all these experiences where all of a sudden mindless, innocently mindless behaviors with food start, whether it's you're afraid, you feel alone, Maybe you were poor as a child and you rarely ever got like a treat or certain foods. And so when you did, you like grabbed it all and went in your room and hid and ate as much of it as you could because it was like feast and famine, right? So these are the kinds of experiences through childhood, but not only childhood, it could have, you could have been like, I have had a healthy relationship with food until a year ago when I had to move across the world and had a very, it was very uncomfortable and it was a massive life change and I didn't know how to cope with it. Or maybe you had a significant breakup that happened, you know, recently that really has left you in this place of feeling hurt or unworthy. And you're soothing in that way. And that is really fueled your relationship with food. So it's really this wounding, these hurts, these experiences, no matter how big or small, that I think what they start to do is they convince us or we start to convince ourselves that because of this experience, I must not be good enough. I must not look good enough. I'm not adequate enough. I'm not smart enough, pretty enough, whatever the things are. 
And we really create this emotional void within ourselves, this lack of self-love, this unworthiness, this I don't feel good enough. And as this void gets bigger because of the wounding, the negative interactions with others, the reaffirmation of it, like then I had friends, grandmothers saying, oh, Amber's bigger than her friend. Like, is she right? And just these things accumulate into your mind and your memory. And so then over time we have this void and then we find ourselves using food as a soother, whether we're, you know, in a sad state or a happy state, or then we're trying to control food and diet to lose weight because we think that that's going to make us feel good enough. And so I think this whole, everything I've just shared, and obviously there's a lot more, really starts to create this emptiness inside. And then we try to use food to soothe and fill a void or give ourselves the comfort. However, we're never going to fill that void with the food. Time for a short advertisement break. Now, I know we talk a lot about food freedom on this podcast and how important it is to take care of yourself mentally and physically as you learn to navigate a culture inundated with toxic messaging. One of the best ways to take care of yourself is through exercise, but I know it can be really hard to find an exercise program that isn't rooted in these toxic messages and doesn't feel triggering. Well, I recently met Katie, the owner of an amazing new exercise company called We Shape. We Shape doesn't focus on calorie counting, tracking how much you work out, or making you feel bad about your body to get you motivated. Instead, they create a customized exercise routine for you that helps you connect with and care for your body rather than feel the pressure to change it. They help you learn to set intentions that come from a place of self-care rather than self-judgment and they support you every step of the way with an amazing community and live coaching so you can make exercise a self-care practice that helps you feel better in your body and about your body. Plus, they're giving listeners of the show the chance to try it out for two full weeks for free. Just head on over to weshape.com forward slash freedom or check out the link in the show notes to get started today. Yeah, and I think you were sort of sharing that. And I think it just shows, doesn't it, that there's so many multiple ways, aren't there, really, that your yes. child can become, your inner child can become wounded. And it may be like, I mean, it sounds like for you, Amber, like I just feel for you so much, like it sounds like you had a lot of really a lot of focus on your kind of body and all of that from so young, which I think is incredibly challenging, isn't it? Because I think of my experience, in many ways, I was very fortunate, actually, like my relationship with food was pretty okay, really, until my mid teens, you know, there was lots of other stuff going on that wasn't particularly great, you know, with kind of over control Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. difficult family sort of situations going on. And I definitely like did not feel good enough. You know, I definitely had that kind of wounded inner child, but it didn't really get projected onto food in my body until I was sort of in my mid to late teens. And, you know, as you're sort of okay. talking about as well, you know, related to kind of a breakup and a transition and lots of other stresses going on. But it's so interesting, isn't it? I think, you know, all our experiences are very different. And yeah. I guess, yeah, is it really helpful then when someone's just even that's listening to this and starting to recognize maybe they relate to some of these things that you're saying would be the first step to perhaps just have a, you know, exploration of one's past and to really acknowledge perhaps different things that have contributed to this wounding. Oh, 100%. I think that's such an important place to start. Have love and compassion for yourself. You didn't know what you didn't know. Just like neither you or I knew how to process through those experiences, right? And then it's like, okay, let me reflect. Let me look at you know, what has happened in my life? And it may be something very significant or it may seem very subtle and small. I'll give you another quick example. So growing up, right, my mom was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis before I was born and I was the only child. And obviously it was a very hard circumstance for both of my parents to try and figure out because with multiple sclerosis, you just slowly start losing control over everything. And so there's just certain circumstances as a child that I would witness my mom go through very traumatic experiences where, you know, she would end up with like a numb foot and just like fall over or, you know, say something like completely out of left field because of just, you know, how things change in the brain. And so when you're a child and you're like witnessing this, you feel so heartbroken because it's like the woman, the mother who gave you birth, who you adore so much, you just, you're witnessing their decline and you feel so helpless that you can't help. And then it's like the pain you feel from her and the fear of like, what's going to happen to me? You know what I mean? So it's just like all this emotion going on. And at the time it didn't feel so significant until I started to look back and go, oh my gosh, no wonder 
I was also using food and trying to grasp for control with food because I felt out of control and helpless with my mom who I cared for so much. So I think, you know, all of these awarenesses and memories for me, I started to have when I was healing my relationship with food and started to connect with my inner child because what I realized, and this is going back to like the first steps is sitting and reflecting even just for a few minutes, you know, once a week or twice a week where you're like, okay, let me think about childhood. Like, what was the regular conversations in my house? You know, did my parents celebrate me when I brought my report card home from school? Or did they go, oh, well, that's good, but you can do better. Were you shamed as a child about your weight? Were you put on a diet? Were you restricted? Were you told you had to eat all the food on your plate because there's starving kids and you need to, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, you can't have dessert until you finish this, like whatever the narrative was. But what was it like around the dinner table? How did your parents speak to themselves, to you? I think just, and it's not about blame, but it's just about awareness. What was school like? What was the kids like at school? How were you treated? What kind of content did you start to consume? Because I remember being in like grade two and one of my first compact discs, yes, people, CDs back in the 90s that I bought was the Spice Girls. Mm -hmm. And I'm like in grade two thinking I'm so cool, taking my allowance to buy the CD. But then you know how you buy your CD and you'd pull out the little book and it'd have all the photos, right, of the singers and stuff. And so here's the Spice Girls, like half naked with like these beautiful bodies. And I'm going, oh my gosh, like I don't look like that. Like I have a belly and I'm too big. And like there starts the comparison, right? And so all of this just makes you be even harder on yourself. And what it does is it makes the void bigger. And so just being aware of what books was I reading? What magazines was I reading? What kind of TV shows, music videos, et cetera, was I watching where I started to compare myself and that also fueled, you know, negative self-talk or like this part of me that doesn't feel good enough. And then I think that's really the first step is like looking at all the external conditioning and then like the environment and the family and how you grew up because you're going to gather some awareness and understanding. And what a lot of people don't realize is our wounded inner child for the most part is actually leading most people and is running the show for most adults and they don't even realize it. They're leading with their fears, their insecurities. They don't feel good enough. So they're people pleasing. They're trying to be perfect with everything. They're going into all or nothing mentalities with food, their exercise, their diet, whatever it is. They're being critical of themselves. And where all of this is coming from are these experiences that happen at the younger age or that happened a year ago that really were massive life changes for you that you haven't given attention to, time to work through or healed. So for example, right? I call this the ego. This is where the ego mind really gets kicked up. So I was very insecure in my body through my adolescence, my teens, my early 20s, very critical. But there was this wounded five-year-old within me that had been hurt on the bus that I didn't know was there and I was ignoring her. And so she was getting more and more upset and that was fueling my insecurity. And so once I started doing my healing and starting to actually just talk to my inner child and acknowledge her, that even just started to fill that void more and help me heal those past memories and wounds. So I'll pause there, but I think awareness is one of the biggest first steps and actually just understanding you have an inner child. So what ages, it doesn't have to be exact numbers, but what ages, what times in your life do you have these memories where you feel like, oh, I'm still behaving out of people pleasing, or I'm still, you know, behaving in this way, you know, for fear of letting someone down from when I was seven, right? Yeah, and it's so helpful, Amber. And I think what I'm finding as well sometimes today is I think we have so much information, don't we, with sort of social mm. media and all the sort of strategies and skills and everything. And I think understandably, because it's painful, a lot of us are really scared of going back and reconnecting with those earlier memories and experiences and feelings because it is often, isn't it, very painful. And sometimes when we, if we've buried that for a long time, when we first engage with all of those feelings and memories, we often feel worse before mm. we feel better. But sometimes yeah. I think it does kind of put people off, doesn't it? And I think sometimes they think, oh, I don't want to deal with the past, you know, just kind of give me the strategies. You know, I know from my journey, that kind of deeper work, it's hard, but it truly is the way through, isn't it? And, you know, would you agree with that? You know, we can't really bypass that, can we? Yeah, hundred percent. We can't bypass it. You can't go to the store and buy a bottle of self-love or heal emotional eating or heal my wounded inner child. Like I know the inner work feels hard in the beginning, but we have to do it if we really want to get where we want to go. And that's the honest truth. And we've been 
condition, like you said, into the quick fixes and the strategies. And, you know, we can choose that, but we're probably just going to keep spinning our wheels. And so at some point it's like, be willing and open to just baby step keyword, baby step into starting to, you know, process through things from the past, starting to connect with your inner child. Cause here's the thing. I don't know about you, but for me, it was like small steps because if I tried to do too much at once, yeah, I did feel poorly and I was exhausted and it's just like, oh my gosh, this is what healing is. Like, I thought you were supposed to feel better afterward Mm -hmm. because I pushed it in your nervous system, right? Your Mm -hmm. adrenal health, your hormones, all these parts of you that are trying to get you back to this rest and digest homeostasis, they don't want to be pushed, forced, or rushed too fast. So if you try to do healing too fast, or you try to, you know, see a million people at the same time to get help to make it go away faster, that can put you into a healing crisis. And we don't want that. So baby steps slowly and surely is the way. And I think like spacing it out when I have a session with a client and we spend five or 10 minutes doing some inner child connection, I always say to them, make sure you have a restful evening, lots of water, get to bed early. You're going to process. And ideally, probably, you probably don't want to do another inner child for at least another week or so, right? This isn't, oh, now I know my wounding and I'm going to every night, I'm going to sit down and I'm (laughs) going to knock them out and heal it, right? Like that's not probably going to feel very good for you. So be patient and be willing to take the time and go slow with it because that's going to give you the best outcome, I think. And it's going to help your nervous system and you and your body as a whole process the most efficiently, but it's fully worth it. And I think once you get into it and you start to realize it's it's not as scary as your, you know, ego mind has made it up to be and that, yeah, it's uncomfortable. Of course it is, but that you're brave enough and you're courageous enough and that you can do it. It provides you with the desire and the will to keep chipping away at it. Mm. Yeah, no, great advice there. And Amber, in your journey, did you find kind of writing or speaking aloud or movement or a combination of lots of things really helped you to do this sort of deeper inner child work? Yeah. So for me, what I started to do was I actually started to sit in a comfortable position, close my eyes and revisit the five-year-old that got bullied on the bus because that was my biggest wound. And that was the thing that just kept feeling like, it was unresolved. And so I'd close my eyes and I would be in me at the current time. And I'd go on the bus with her and I'd be right beside her and just be like, I'm so sorry you had to go through this, but everything's okay. I'm here. And I'd let her just grieve in my arms and cry and let all the emotion out and just really reassure her, tell her how much I loved her and that she was going to be okay and that she was safe. And so that's what I started to do. And it usually Usually would last about five to 10 minutes at most. And just every time I went in, it felt like I had less of an emotional reaction to the circumstance. And then I knew I had healed it when we went in for the last time and there was no negative emotion. It just felt neutral. I felt such a connection to her and it happened. And she's like, it's okay. Like, I know you've got my back and we're good. And like, that was a beautiful feeling. So the other thing I like to do, and I still connect with my inner child because I think it's important that we revisit different circumstances. I just did one where I connected with me from a year ago and I sat and closed my eyes and I just, you know, hugged myself and rubbed my arm really softly. And I'm just like, oh, you know what? I'm so proud of you and like everything you've been through, you're safe, you're supported. If there's anything you're still feeling insecure about from this time, like let me know so we can work through it. And I just want you to know that you're okay, you're safe. And just that reaffirmation I think is really powerful. And of course it takes time to get to the point where you believe it when you're telling yourself, because if you're fighting with your body, there can be a resistance, but those are some of the ways I do it. But everyone has a different way and it's not coining it right or wrong. Like it might be writing for some of you, it might be dance for some of you. It may be you know, hugging yourself and gentle self-talk or visualization. So play around with how do you want to connect with these parts of you? And I think it's great, isn't it? That permission just to experiment and try out different things and see what's going to work because we are all a bit different. Yeah, exactly. So I know Amber as well in my journey, I definitely had this fantasy that, you know, once I'd gone through all the sort of, you know, working through kind of the childhood stuff, really understanding, you know, the the ways that my inner child had been wounded, etc. I really thought, right, now I'm going to talk to the adults in my life, and they're going to apologize. And (laughs) (laughs) we're all going to walk off into the sunset, and it's going to be happy Um, days. And of course, it wasn't quite like that. (laughs) But I wonder if you could talk a little bit to that, because I think sometimes as well, 
Oh, we do, you know, part of the kind of healing as well, isn't it, is coming to a place of acceptance and, you know, working towards a place of feeling sort of forgiveness and understanding for the people in our lives, maybe that were absolutely doing the best they could at the time, but while also really honouring our own feelings and our experiences. And so could you sort of say a little bit about all of that? Yeah, a hundred percent, right? You think, oh, I've healed. Now everyone's going to totally understand. And like, (laughs) we're all just going to, like you said, skip off into the sunset. It's like not necessarily, right? So I think it's so important that, yeah, we gift the grace to the people who are around us growing up and that they were doing the best they can with what they had. And a lot of it was like innocent behavior, right? It doesn't mean that we go, oh, I'm going to tolerate someone treating me like that again. No, you, you learn how to set your healthy boundaries so that you're you know, coming from a place of love, but also standing in your power. And at the same time, I think we have to detach from the outcome of how, you know, the experiences we went through when we were younger and expecting those parents or those friends or those people that impacted us to change because they may never change. And we can't make anyone change and we don't have control over anyone else and their behaviors or what they say do, blah, blah, blah. So I think it's really important to learn detachment and have really powerful boundaries and go, I'm not going to tolerate being treated X, Y, you know, in these ways, if certain family members or friends are still going to say certain things or treat me a certain way, even after I set a boundary or have a conversation, well, then you get to decide how you want to navigate that. And for me personally, it was, well, if people are going to treat me like this, I'm going to set distance. I am going to set boundaries. I've had conversations. It's not sinking in. So therefore, there is going to be a bit more distance. I don't even have to verbally say that. I can just shift the way I'm showing up around this person. It's going to look different for everybody, right? But I think the key is the more you heal yourself and you make peace with your past, you forgive others. It doesn't mean you have to have them closely in your life unless you desire to. But I think the key is you focusing your energy on healing yourself, overcoming and, you know, clearing your wounding from the past, regulating your own nervous system, healing your own relationship with food, because you cannot control anyone else around you. And you don't have the deciding factor to say, hey, you should heal because I healed, right? And the more energy we keep in for ourselves to do our own healing and create, you know, our own amazing life. Well, that's, I think, what we should be focusing on rather than trying to fix other people because we've healed and we want others to experience what we have. Of course, we want others to be happy and healed, but that's not up to us. So I think let go of expectations around, I've done my healing, so now like everyone else is going to receive me really well. Be optimistic, of course, that things will turn out for the best outcome for you and everyone else. But if other people don't change, don't be hard on yourself and assume that you haven't done all the healing. Yeah, no, it's so true, isn't it? Everyone's on their own journey and people have to be ready. And I think as well, you know, sometimes I just feel very fortunate. I think sort of the generation that we have been born into, we have so much more access to kind of therapy and mental health. And yeah, whereas like back in the day, it was just pretty abysmal, wasn't it really? Yes. (laughs) You just had to kind of get on with it. And yeah, you know, sometimes there's just been such a shift, hasn't there? I think sometimes as well, it's just very challenging for people to understand when they've been brought up in such a different way. Yeah, it is. And I think, you know, some of us have been conditioned that it's not a big deal to just be strong and to just, you know, put a good face on, right? And so we just think that like feeling is weak or or doing our deeper work or getting help is weak, a sign of like, there's something wrong with me, depending on the familial upbringing. Yeah, there never used to be a lot of support. And I think a lot of our parents and grandparents are like so set in their ways and they're, you know, love them to death, but they're so stubborn that they don't want to look at it. And you have to come to this place of acceptance and go, that's okay. I'm going to do my part and let the rest go. And just like send love to the people that you wish would change, but aren't because it is, it's such a generational shift from our generation to our parents or our grandparents. Right. So We just got to try and have love and compassion and patience for them. Because I will tell you, my dad is one of them. I love him dearly. (laughs) I love him dearly. But he is constantly like complaining and being negative about his health. And he's not really taking care of himself. And so things keep cropping up and he just gets so frustrated. And if I ever try to give my two cents or an idea or a suggestion, he just gets triggered and gets upset. So it's like, well, there's no point. I'm going to love him and have Mm -hmm. compassion for him. 
but the rest is completely out of my hands and I've detached from that. And I think it's a very empowering place to sit because I can love my father, but I'm not getting emotionally involved with his struggles because otherwise I'd be miserable all the time, right? So we have to learn those invisible boundaries and learn emotional detachment while we can still love our family members, our friends that are struggling, but it's not my responsibility to fix my father, just like it wasn't my responsibility to fix my mother, right? So... Yeah, no, it's so true, isn't it? Like really sort of finding that emotional detachment, which takes time, doesn't it? it as does. well, you know, yeah. I know my own journey, just the whole, like in a way, rationally understanding that probably quite early on, but then mm-hmm. still feeling kind of guilty and responsible. You know, it definitely took time to really sort of detach in a healthy way. Yeah. So it can still be in relationship you know, similar with my dad, but definitely with very healthy boundaries. (laughs) Yeah. It's just about having those loving, healthy boundaries. And you're coming from a place of love and respect for both parties. And I think that's the most important thing for everyone to understand is Mm -hmm. the more we love ourselves and honor ourselves, we come from love and respect for everybody around us. And we're truly doing what's best for both parties. And that is a courageous step to take, to step out of the old ways of being right? Because you don't want to let anybody down. It's like, no, like I need to establish healthy boundaries so that the relationship stays healthy. Yeah, and it's so true. Now, Amber, I know this is such a vast topic, really, which we could talk about for hours, but I'm just wondering, (laughs) are there kind of any sort of like last little points that you'd really like to mention, perhaps that could be important on the healing ones wounded in a child journey? Yeah, I'll leave you with like a couple key things. I think the first thing is, To be really patient with yourself and your inner child, because likely it's been years of conditioning, programming, right? Memories that have been stored up in your body. So be really patient and take it one step at a time. Like I said earlier, as far as figuring out how do you want to connect with yourself and, you know, be willing and open to dedicate even just five minutes once a week to think of a circumstance from a year ago, 10 years ago, when you were a child where something happened that you feel it's still like you're hanging on to it. You're still upset about it and start just going in and asking questions, playing around, seeing how she feels or how he feels and just exploring. I think the second thing is to really like our inner child is a gift. And I think when we become adults, we go, I'm an adult now. I have to be mature. I have to like, I can't have a stuffed animal in it. You know what I mean? But the inner child within us loves play, loves fun. We take life way too seriously as we become adults. And so it's like also be willing to bring play and fun and joy into your life because the more you nurture your inner child with play, fun, and joy, the happier your inner child is there's a lot less of a void. So as an example, I am 36 and I still have stuffed animals and I love them. And that is something that lights up my inner child. In our new house, we have a yard bunny and we name all the animals, but like his name is Howard and he lights my inner child up. It's so (laughs) cute. So it's like, how am I playing with my inner child? Because she's there. She's going to be there even when I'm 95. So how am I lighting her up and connecting with her and bringing more fun and joy and play into my life? Music, dancing, coloring, hobbies, like what is it that lights you up? Getting out in nature, going for a hike, spending time with friends. But what you'll find is there's this balance between that deeper, uncomfortable work and bringing the play, the lightness, the fun. Yeah, no, so that, that's with what you. I would say. <laughs> yeah no fantastic Amber I think like great points to leave everyone on and I think yeah no it's wonderful isn't it I think just really being in touch with the silliness and playfulness of your inner child and your rabbit sounds lovely Howard oh yes he's so cute we love it so much sometimes I leave a carrot out for him because you know he's cute oh. but yeah it's all about that play and never forget that part of you is inside that still wants you to play and have fun no matter your age yeah so true Okay, well, Amber, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Actually, before I say a proper thank you, where can people find you? And have you got anything that you want to mention that you've got going on at the moment? Yeah, thank you again for having me. It's always a pleasure. So the best place to find me is the website, amberapproved.ca. I have a free emotional eating quiz if you're wondering if you're struggling as well. If you're wanting to explore doing some healing with your inner child, healing your relationship with food, and you know, really building this 
confidence with yourself and your worth, there's a complimentary consultation you can book. And then the podcast. So the No Sugar Coding podcast has over almost 500 episodes now, believe it or not. And if you like today's conversation, you'll absolutely love listening to those episodes. So on any podcast app, as well as the website. Fantastic. Well, I shall make sure that that's all in the show notes. So thank you so much. Yeah, well, thank you, Amber. Love having you on the podcast. Just really appreciated hearing more about your story today as well, actually. I think to really appreciate your vulnerability and sharing. And I know that's going to just inspire and give so much hope and encouragement to the listeners. So thank you so much. Well, my pleasure. And thank you for holding space for me to be here with you. So I hope you enjoyed this conversation just as much as I did. Do go and check out all of Amber's details in the show notes. If you're not following me already on Instagram, do seek me out the eating disorder therapist underscore. And for further support with your relationship with food, do go to the eating disorder therapist.co.uk. If you're professional listening and working with clients, you may be interested in my online eating disorders and body image courses. And if you are struggling with your relationship with food, you may be interested in my 10 steps to intuitive eating course and also my overcoming bulimia course. All the links are in the show notes notes. If you enjoy this podcast, I would be so grateful if you'd follow, rate and review as it helps it reach so many more listeners. Thank you so much for listening today. And I look forward to sharing another podcast episode with you very soon. 